Good afternoon, everybody. So uh, today we are glad to invite uh, Omar Sarut here uh, to give us a uh, uh, exciting seminar. So this is gonna be a different uh, its previous academic ones. So uh, today uh, uh, Omar gonna share some of his knowledge about the uh, solar power uh, solar uh, solar PV power plants from the eyes of end users. Omar has e rich experience uh, in. Uh, Constructing design and uh, uh, consultation uh, uh, on the M uh, experience in the in in this big PV power plant. He's also famous uh, in this uh, application in this large scale uh, robot cleaning uh, equipments. Uh, so uh, yeah, without further ado, let's welcome Omar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ming. Uh, pleasure to be here uh, in person. So uh, the topic I have today for you guys is basically about the utility scale power plants, PV power plants. And uh, trust me, it's nothing. I'll, I've tried to keep it as less academic as possible. Um, so basically, I've, I've been in power plants. Um, I've been on both sides of the negotiation table. I've been a supplier of equipment. I've been an end user, I've been a negotiator on both sides. So keeping all that into, pers giving into perspective, uh, I've just put together a few things which I believe uh, are of some importance for maybe for you guys, for you to consider when you guys are doing your uh, projects or when you pick up a topic, stuff like that. Because uh, we had a few discussions, uh, Ning, myself and some other common friends, and we, we found out that there were a few things that we can talk about. So. Just just uh, let me know if you have any questions or we can have the question answer session round in the end or even after the session I'm available if anybody wants to have a chat in, public, uh, in private. The other thing is that uh, I've been working most of my life, it's been two decades uh, since I graduated. I'm a mechanical engineer by profession, uh, a bachelor's only, uh, nothing after that, didn't get the time. So after that I've been in uh, petrochemical downstream sectors, I've been in oil and gas, I've been in power and water uh, and on both sides of the table as I mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier. So the gist of the matter is that in solar PV power plants, uh, a lot of, how should I say, growth is happening, particularly these days the high growth areas are identified as Middle East and some of the other world areas. My last 12 to 15 years have been spent mostly in the Middle East uh, in, so in, 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 in all technologies, almost all technologies of power and uh, last five, six years mostly focused on renewables. So that's from where I come from. Uh, uh, so please uh, feel free to ask me whatever you would like to understand from a more practical aspect and less academic aspect to be to be uh, clear from this point onwards. So the way I've uh, split my slide deck here is that uh, I was thinking what to share. Uh, honestly, I did not have a clear topic. So I just put together some slides. They are uh, segregated in terms of uh, the equipment that gets installed at in a solar PV power plant at a utility scale we are talking about. Then uh, a little bit of project development perspective because that's where I believe a bit of a discussion needs to happen. Uh, then the performance aspects of uh, a solar power plant. And of course, uh, there were a lot of other topics, but due to the cons time constraints, we'll, we'll just uh, stick to these topics for now. If there are any questions, we can take up later. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with uh, some of these uh, abbreviations or definitions, but uh, just to move you guys through it, uh, financial close. Uh, how many are familiar with FC financial close here? As I thought. So uh, financial close of a project happens. We will discuss in another slide as well. When the financiers, the, 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 the banks or the lending institutions tell a project company, you are good to go. We are ready to give you money. There you go. There is the money for you. That's the financial close of any project around the globe. Doesn't matter if it's in Australia, Middle East, Americas, wherever. Even Antarctica has this thing to follow as well. Uh, COD, commercial operation date. So the commercial operation date of a solar PV power plant is that particular date in time, not a, not a month or a year, it's, it's a particular date 
on which the solar power plant starts dispatching energy, uh, electrical energy, electricity, and they start getting paid in full from the off takers. Uh, this is a very, very important date. These two milestones, the financial close and the commercial operation date are the main things from an investor pers perspective or an owner perspective of a power plant. Uh, PPA, power purchase agreements, right? So a lot of companies sign power purchase agreements in order to move forward with a uh, power project. LCOE, very good. So we'll have a quick chat about this. GCR, ground coverage ratio. Excellent. So we will we'll, we'll touch base on these topics as well. EPC, engineering, procurement, construction contractors. These are the prime contractors in any, any project uh, around the world. DLP, defect liability periods. It's like a warranty period, but at a project level, the warranty period, if you go buy a mobile phone, you have a warranty for this thing, right? But when you do a project, when someone delivers a project for you, you don't just say, I need a warranty for the project because it has a lot of warranties included in it because every equipment has a warranty, then sometimes the design needs to be warranted, sometimes the execution part needs to be warranted. So in together, it's called the defect liability period for the main prime contractor. Uh, it's something very important, by the way, uh, we will discuss. ONM is operations and maintenance phase, uh, CAPEX is capital expenditure, OPEX is uh, operational expenditure, DEVEX is something also used, sometimes it's the development related expenditure and the DEVEX actually ends at the financial close. Some people use this, some people don't. Mostly used terms are CAPEX and OPEX and in, in, in Middle East and some other parts of the world, the way owners like to define their investment in a project is cost to company. It's not only for the HR folks, cost to company as to what is it that they're going to invest and then they calculate the uh, rate of returns according to that. In a utility scale PV power plant, like, uh, kind of like the uh, residential solar power or commercial solar power, the main difference here is that uh, you are dispatching to the grid if you are dispatching your electrical energy from the rooftops of your houses or your buildings to the grid as well, you have net metering concept and all. Of course, you are following almost the same principle. But in, 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 in the, uh, at a utility scale level, each and everything needs to get, uh, we get into a lot of details. Uh, we get into um, scrutinizing each and every step of the activity literally each and every item that is here uh, gets checked and then we move forward based on that. Uh, some utility scale power plants are backed up by batteries. Most of them are not. Simply because the battery technologies as of today, uh, if I'm an investor and I'm, by the way, I'm not representing any institution here. I'm just speaking from my own side. I'm, I uh, should have introduced that earlier, but I am these days just working as an independent consultant for an organization that I used to work with. It's, it's one of the uh, largest uh, power and water uh, company. Uh, they are at the investor level, at the owner level, at the operator level in the Middle East, Asia and some of the other countries as well. So, okay, let's, let's start discussing how uh, the project environment looks like and what are some of the things. I'll, you may have, I mean, you guys are probably used to looking at PV modules in a different way. I'll talk to you in a different way. So what I'm going to talk to you about on the PV module side, the first step is the configuration of the PV modules. Uh, any idea, anybody has any idea as to what are the benefits of installing in a vertical position, a PV module or a horizontal position? And how do you get to decide which position would be best for the plant that you're going to construct? Fix the sun. I'm sorry? Fix the sun. Oh, of course, facing the sun is, is going to be common for both of them, horizontal or vertical. But in reality, mechanical, mechanical, uh, mechanical structure or, well, yes. One of the basic things that uh, is need that needs to be looked into is what kind of structure is being put to hold the modules in place. So if you have, 
if you have a vertical orientation of the modules, usually the mechanical structure tends to cost less because of the tonnage of the mechanical structure, lesser structure is used. If you put the modules in horizontal positions, you need to put more uh, structure material, simple physics, no rocket science here. When we look into the different uh, configurations, as you can see here, we call portrait or horizontals, right? So 1P, 2P, 3P, up to 5Ps I have seen in, in different power projects. Uh, at a utility scale, by the way. So you just imagine five portrait means 10 meters, 10 meters uh, span. And then the length of the array depends on different factors as well. So when you're talking about uh, developing a power plant, this is one of the first decisions you have to take along with the mounting structure. So the mounting structure comes later, we'll discuss about it. So uh, I'm trying to build um, a kind of um, a point here, which is, that please keep into perspective the cost related factors. Of course, of course, of course, I'm not talking about the efficiency matters as of now, just keep the cost perspective into mind. Because when you are doing power plants at a utility scale, and you're going to bid for a power plant to the, uh, the off-takers or to the re regulators or the authorities, governmental authorities, whoever you're going to bid to, each and every cent counts, not even cent, each and every second decimal to a cent even counts. And we will, we will see that in a in, in few slides from now. So uh, then there are horizontal orientations. Again, it, there is no one size fits all kind of uh, solution here. It depends on what you want to do. It depends on how the project is structured. They, sometimes the, the ground, the area given to you is constant. It cannot expand due to different constraints without going into details. But, and also, you have to come out with the maximum generation out of that area. That is what people at the uh, owner level or the developer level, this is the first dilemma they face. The least possible land size and max possible output. So that land is a fixed cost. And nobody wants to pay for land because one of the biggest issues with solar is it requires a law it's a large piece of land as compared to some of the other um, um, technologies out there and then the capacity factor of solar is also kind of one of the lowest so it doesn't make solar that lucrative when it comes to investment but yes then there are a lot of other benefits the carbon footprints and so and so forth uh, you guys know much more about the monofacials versus the bifacials. Uh, as I understand, in this school, uh, you guys are doing cutting edge research. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about that, but yeah, monofacials have been used for max number of years. Uh, there is a trend of shifting from monofacials to bifacials, and then within bifacials as well, there are different types of technologies. So uh, I'll just skip this part, but when it comes to bifacials, today when, when we sit on around the table and we start developing the blueprint of a power plant, uh, the very first two, three things that come to mind are the ground albedos and the bifacial gains. Uh, somehow the industry, uh, the, the, uh, the module industry today is, is, is in a way, we don't get, if, if I have to actually see how much generation I'm getting from the back of the module and how much generation I'm actually getting from the front of the module, I don't think there is any uh, means of doing that at a utility scale level. Maybe at a single module level, there could be some ways but not at a utility scale level. But just for uh, understanding purpose, uh, considering a 500 megawatt power plant using bifacial modules around 500 watt peak or more than that, uh, just imagine the number of modules being used to generate that kind of uh, power and electrical energy. Uh, so the, when we talk about these many modules, a lot of things come into perspective. So there are, the general losses that everybody know, we all know of what kind of losses we, we have in a PV system, in a PV power plant, but uh, there are some, some losses we, which we actually see in the field, which are really, sometimes we don't even understand why these things are happening. Uh, suddenly one entire string 
starts showing up as the entire string is hot. Now try to decipher what's what's wrong. So there are number of ways to understand what's what's going on. Is it one module causing the entire thing, or something else going on? Uh, so on and so forth. There are different scenarios in which we have to consider all of this. Now coming back to the ground albedo, uh, there are module suppliers have been doing some uh, research about it. I'm I'm not here to talk about any particular module supply, but when I was looking into this, I found one uh, picture which was from one module supplier. Again, no no marketing anything of anybody, but the uh, they, this is just for understanding purpose at the albedo level. So different grounds have different albedos. Uh, usually, definitely the white color, the more the white color of the ground is, the more uh, albedo you're going to get. And then based on that, the bifacial gain eventually increases. Bottom line, when I'm looking at a plant, I'm standing in a plant and I'm looking at all these modules, I don't know what is the ground albedo. Maybe by using an albedo meter, I can probably get to know what is the ground albedo at that particular area, not the entire plant. So keep, keep a tap on the kind of issues that are happening in practical life. You don't get to put albedo meters around the entire site. There are only few dedicated sites, places, spots inside the power plant. Power plant could be kilometers. It is in kilometers, four by five kilometers, seven by eight kilometers. So you can't put so many albedo meters. It will make the project not worth doing it. It will just increase the cost unnecessarily. Currently, there is no rule, there is no kind of uh, literature or any, any research material, at least I have found, which says that how many albedo meters should be installed per 10 megawatt or 100 megawatt or 500 megawatts. So it's, it's a kind of uh, uh, pick and choose at the moment. So when you put these albedo meters, it will only give you the albedo of that particular surrounding area, not the albedo of the entire plant. So there could be mismatches there. Now, uh, when you model the plant early enough during the project development phase, we consider that everything is going to go hunky-dory. The albedo, is go albedo meters are going to tell the entire uh, plant is going to cover the entire plant. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen that way. So I don't know what is the albedo at a particular plant, uh, at a particular site within a plant. And I even don't know if I put my hand on one module, I don't know what is the bifacial gain coming out of this module. All I know is the current and the voltage, that's it. And at the end of the day, all of this gets translated into different performance measures by which we translate the performance of a power plant or the performance of different contractors. Let's put it this way as well. So when we do our uh, research, when we are looking into developing something really useful to help the industry, please keep these things in mind because these are some of the practical things. Nobody gets to know exactly what was the bifacial gain. It's all kind of hypothetical at the moment. Uh, then, of course, the when we were talking about the ground coverage ratios and all, it's a chicken and egg story. Uh, how do you place these modules? How do you how do you define the inter row spacing? How do you define the how much is going to be the height of the bottom edge of the module from the ground? Oh, first of all, is the ground completely flat? Usually, no. The grounds are undulated. Wherever these projects happen, you can see on internet. Uh, I have seen some crazy pictures coming out of China as well, where they put solar uh, modules on, on top of hills. So it increases the challenges altogether. How do you maintain the distance between two rows is where uh, experience is required, is where uh, of course, statistical analysis are there, but then experience counts as well. Uh, a lot of other things come into perspective. What if are you using fixed tilt mounting systems or are you using trackers? We will talk about it in the next slides. But we need to make an estimate. We need to make good um, calculated uh, assumptions and guesses as to where to put these modules, where to actually put the piles of those structures. So in order to have those gaps between these uh, rows. Now, why do we need gaps? Why can't we just bring these rows together? That would actually save a lot of land. But there are different uh, problems associated with those. 
uh, okay, before we'll talk about these in another slide is coming up. But uh, before we move there, the International Technology Roadmap for Photovoltaics last year they published these charts. I just took it from there. So there is a trend now within the module industry to move from the P type, the perks, to the N type technology. It is already happening. Uh, I don't want to talk about the projects I've been involved in. I've seen both modules. I've seen uh, some really, we call it cutting edge science at our side, uh, since we don't have a microscopes and we don't do these researches. But uh, what we do is we take intelligent risks. Uh, I am part of the institutions, I am part of those organizations, I have been part of those organizations and I still work with them. So when I say we, I am not associating with anyone, I am just saying that being on this side of the table when you are designing the power plants, you have to take into consideration all these minute details as well. Now of course the shift towards higher efficiency of a module is very, very important because the higher the efficiency of the module means at a collective level in a power plant if you are using 1 million modules, 2 million modules. The most I have seen in a power plant are around 3 point something million modules, one power plant. So just imagine how do you, we, we look into the losses, we look into different aspects in a module, coatings, anti-reflective coatings, anti-soiling coatings, so on and so forth. Uh, a point one percent increase in efficiency over three plus million modules means a lot. So that's what that's what the uh, developers actually are looking forward to. Uh, at the inverter level, uh, usually there are these two kinds of inverters that are used in a utility scale power plant, central inverters or string inverters. Uh, both have good uh, efficiencies, but when it comes to selecting which one, there are different uh, rules of the game. I mean, I'll probably not be able to stand here and tell you go for this one because again, it, it all depends on the site, the, the different uh, parameters that you are dealing with in order to come up with the, uh, with the best uh, solution to generate that much electrical energy from the, from the minimum possible uh, footprint of the power plant. So there are different pros and cons. Uh, you guys can read it, I can share with you later as well. But all in all, when we are talking about central inverters, please keep in mind that the central inverters when used in a power plant, uh, the, the number of central inverters are pretty low as compared to string inverters because string inverters are quite a few, quite a lot as compared to central for the same power plant. So the number of issues get uh, amplified for string inverters because you have to deal with a lot of devices. But at the same time, there are pluses. If one central inverter goes out, you, gen you, you are actually getting one complete block because the power plant is, de is designed in different blocks, right? A 500 megawatt power plant could maybe have 80 blocks or 100 blocks, right? So you, one, one central inverter may be providing, uh, may be used for uh, two blocks, three blocks, one block, depending on how the blocks are structured. So you're out of the entire block. But for the string inverter side, if one inverter goes down, no problem. It's usually a very small uh, part of the plant. You can take it out. It's a plug and play, bring a new inverter. There you go. It doesn't take that long. So there are some benefits of, of string over central. When it comes to costings, I don't want to divulge into that discussion, but there are some suppliers who have better costings. There are some suppliers, and I'm talking about the cost overall, not only capital expenditure, but also the maintenance uh, regime, all that costs as well. So you take into consideration, we don't only take into consideration capital expenditures. We take into consideration the entire thing. At the end of 25 years, because a power purchase agreement could be 25 years, 30 years, 20 years, whatever the case is. So at the end of 20 years, plus the development period, what was the total cost? So that's where uh, the, the analysis uh, actually is getting done. Uh, 
okay moving forward to the mounting systems now there are different mounting systems that are used in a power plant and this is something really interesting it's it's uh, it's just a structural element from the looks of it right but when you try to go a bit deep into it you will see how what are the benefits associated with just increasing uh, by putting the mounting system properly or deciding upon the right mounting system uh, we come across different scenarios of power generations if you see in this picture uh, I'll go ahead and uh, start introducing so this is just a fixed tilt structure right on the other hand this is a single axis tracker what is a single axis tracker a machine that can rotate something on one axis right uh, there are dual axis trackers as well a machine which can rotate the same thing in two axes so which one to use again it comes down to a techno commercial analysis what are the benefits what are the costs associated are we getting the right amount of power output by injecting more uh, dollars into the project so it's at the end of the day it comes down to all of this and we'll see in a moment but then there are some other very interesting setups that have come off late like for example the dome shaped fixed tail structure I don't know if you guys have heard about this dome shaped fixed tail structure but maybe if you can show me with your hands I'm not going to ask any questions yep correct dome shaped uh, structures are primarily used to generate power from a really small uh, land if you and this is all public information uh, without taking any company names you can google it uh, usually the water sector the water desalination sector uh, has got attracted to this type of uh, system why because in a water desalination plant you have lots of uh, space available so what generally people do is they put up the you can put single axis trackers there as well but the cost goes up but so they put these dome shaped uh, structures please keep into consideration that these dome shaped structures are actually east west oriented these are not north south oriented usually when you put single axis trackers you put the trackers in north south direction so if this is the east for me and this is the west for me sun is going to go in this direction so you put the tracker in north south direction so that the module can follow the sun right but with these structures with these dome structures you put them in east west direction so that the sun can easily go from east to west and these structures can't move so for half a day almost half a day this side will generate more this side will generate less but then you see here this thing this dip this dip is caused because exactly at noon the solar noon the sun is at the top and not no no side of this dome is generating enough because of the angles because of the angle of these structures and once the sun moves towards the west side the other side starts generating so this is for an east west system there are different things the main concept here is for a fixed tilt plant for a fixed tilt just a fixed tilt structure nothing else you are losing a lot on the uh, i'm not sure if i've got that no i don't have that slide here but for a fixed tilt plant it's basically just you are you losing on uh, for this normal distribution curve let me put it this way the the distribution is lesser but for a single axis tracker you are actually trying to also take into consideration these additional uh, uh, you make use of this uh, this 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 energy as well from the sun and you convert it into electrical energy so there are different uh, there are different types of trackers there are so many companies in the world again you can google who is the top one but there are these top 5 uh, that are mostly used in the utility scale sector uh, from the us to the europe to the to to china to some other parts of the world they are all scattered in there but the selection of these companies depend on a lot of factors not just one factor it's it's it's, it's again it's uh, at the end of the day it all gels down to the techno commercial analysis uh 
in the in the tracker side there are things like um, the drive mechanism usually some of the trackers individual tracker is just an in single axis tracker individual is roughly 100 meter long a little less than that uh, it depends on how many modules it can hold it depends on a lot of things there is a lot of science behind it and i i'm personally connected with the technology teams of these top five or six tracker companies uh, their CTOs or whatever and we, we have a lot of sessions to understand what they are doing what I'm showing you here is just the tip of the iceberg there's a lot to do in here but if one of the major issues that we encounter that power plants encounter is the wind effect on trackers for the fixed tilt uh, structure the wind effect is not going to be that that problematic as compared to a tracker just imagine if I if myself you consider me as the post my head is that where the motor and the gear is for the uh, tracker and my arms are the torque tubes of the tracker so when and there's nothing else there is no other connection with the ground except this one pile plus if the torque tube uh, depends on the length of the tracker the torque tube is then supported from the ground and different combinations there is no again no one solution fits all but then what is happening is when there is high wind event and the wind events are measured um, in up to three second gusts at 10 meter height there's a standard for that how much wind is going to have what kind of an effect on the tracker so there is a permissible wind uh, speed and then there are the then there are uh, speeds beyond which the tracker goes to an angle which is called a winch to angle at the winch to angle the tracker company assumes that this is the safest position for their tracker now this is something interesting and maybe i leave with you guys if you guys want to look deep into it this is something really uh, which requires a bit of understanding is some companies have five degrees as to angle some 15 some 30 some 55 and each one says the other company has their own system our company we have this system and interestingly the drive mechanism is almost the same some of them they have two or three or multiple uh, rows of trackers connected to one motor via a transmission piece so one motor drives multiple rows of course the motor power is more some uh, just one motor driving one uh, talk tube so there are different scenarios but this is something of immense importance these days because I can tell you I've personally I've not been to those sites but I have seen the the repercussions the issues that come that that are associated with high wind events and what happens really when high wind happens these trackers modules are blown off I've actually seen pictures you can google them you will find it. and then in order to avoid this fluttering of the tracker a lot of research is going in by these tracker companies but still uh, we I see as as a independent consultant level the the speed where the single axis one portrait single axis tracker I'm not even talking about two portraits currently the one portrait is kind of mature now two portrait is still getting mature this is what I believe but in the one portrait the moment the wind speed goes above 10 meter per second which is nothing you will see that the tracker goes to wind stow. 12 meter per second in some cases some cases 15 meter per second but this is all debatable again depends on a lot of factors so these are some of the real life issues that power plant developers are facing and are limited if these issues can be resolved there is a lot more that can be done from the same machines uh, then uh, backtracking and and how these companies are making use of it so if you see these two images so what I'm trying to just show here is that in standard tracking all trackers will well by the way most of the trackers are following an algorithm they don't have uh, an active device that is actually tracking the Sun based on the uh, the latitude longitude and other details of the site exact site there is an algorithm which is built into their their, their system and the tracker starts operating even if there is no sun imagine imagine for hypothetical purposes one day the sun doesn't come out the tracker will still track 
checks? So yeah, there could be certain uh, stops, certain checks, but but this is how the tracking algorithms are as of today. I'm not going into other detail because then this is all proprietary material of the tracker companies. But then uh, this is something where uh, I think research needs to be done and they need to come up with a uh, I'm not addressing anyone here, but I'm just saying that this is where something can be done uh, in order to get a better product. Now, in some companies, you will see individual trackers can also change angles. How does this happen? It all depends on the control system then. How is the control system software written? Is it robust enough? Is it taking into consideration the backtracking? So just imagine if there are two rows, if I bring these two rows closer and they go towards the sunset, before sunset, an hour before sunset, the, the shade created by the first row, if sun is on this side, on the row behind it is pretty big. So how do you get rid of it? You space it apart. You space it in a way that this row does not create shadow on this row. These are very important things. You might say, okay, this is what, at the, towards the end of the day, what difference does it make? I invite you to come and see what difference does it make, especially, uh, well, in Australia, it will make a lot of difference as well uh, because of the latitude Australia is in and the longitude. So the at sunset, before sunset and after sunrise, these are the times when we also want to get the maximum output. We just, just don't want any shadings or shading losses from the power plant. So again, this spacing between the rows become very important. And if one tracker can move independent of the other, it is, it is good. It, it really helps. Uh, okay. Cleaning equipment. Now, my experience, most of my experience have be, has been in the Middle East. Uh, even other than Middle East, there are a lot of zones in the world where the soil deposition rate is extremely high. Uh, there are research papers. I have put an image in my slides i'll show you later but there are research papers which have who have actually calculated how much soil is deposited in which area around the world um, australia seems to be seems to be in the uh, kind of acceptable zones but again where are the power plants at utility scales where do you go and build those power plants where the radiance is maximum and where is the radiance maximum usually in deserted areas so the moment you go into deserts, you have a lot of sand, a lot of sand accumulating on, des uh, on, on the modules. I have personally been in a lot of deserts and a lot of plants, and I have seen how, I'm not talking about sandstorm events, I'm just talking about plain, normal, day-to-day -day life. You have actually, if you just go and stand there for a day, you have to take out sand from literally every hole which is exposed from from your board body. It's so much sand sometimes. So in sandstorm, it's a totally different thing. Sandstorm is a completely uh, different event. I'm not talking about that. But cleaning plays a major role. Uh, I don't know if you are exposed to these studies, but there are studies available on the internet. Uh, I have personally, I am doing some studies with the companies I'm associated with. Uh, but nevertheless, other than that, the public domain information available on the internet, you can lose up to more than 50% of your generation. 50, 50, 60% of your generation if you don't clean the modules. So this one particular item is becoming, has become one of the fastest growing industry now for solar PV power plants, the way I see it. I can, I'm connected to a lot of uh, companies who provide cleaning services. Uh, a lot of companies, actually more than two dozen of them. And uh, I have done some personal research on this topic. Uh, I am also, different types of cleanings have been looked into. So gone are the days when we used to do, or anybody used to do non-automated cleanings. You can do non-automated cleanings on your rooftops of your houses, not of your buildings even. For your buildings, you require automated solutions. Now, there are some semi-automated cleaning solutions whereby you can either drive a machine 
Okay, forget about the names here. This is just taken from one of my own LinkedIn article. So I just copied it from there. Uh, there are different companies who provide different types of products. There are some machines which can literally move on the modules like a mouse and they go on clean. Uh, they can be put on the modules and taken away by someone. So human intervention is required. That's why the word SEMA exists here. Otherwise, if it's a fully automated solution, in a fully automated solution, you should practically not require any human intervention. Ask me, is there any fully automated solution? Well, yes, if you talk to the companies, they definitely claim they are fully automated. In reality, at the power plants, all these developers, owners, operators, because this is something that the operator has to live with for the term of the project, 20 years, whatever, are they really fully automated? Uh, I take a pinch of salt for that. <laughs> uh, they, sometimes humor intervention is still needed because again, talking about this technology, this is not mature technology. These are all startups. When did they start? The, if you go just back into recent history, four years, three years, two years, one year, five years max, six years, the company was incorporated six years ago. What have you done up to now? Well, we are coming up with the next generation of robots. How many generation of robots are there? Five, six, two, three, depending on the company when it was uh, there. Okay, they have products which are good if they are selling it in a market. Put them on a power plant. I can tell you with my own experience, it doesn't work properly. So the point I'm trying to make here is, it takes effort by different companies to develop their products. Doesn't mean it will work in a power plant environment to the satisfaction of the owners and the operators who are the customers for them, right? To make these machines work in a regulated power plant environment is, the, is, is where the buck stops and is where a lot of work is being done uh, by some companies around the world and uh, this is where some research is still needed. These machines need wireless communications. Wireless communications today exist in the form of Zigbee's, LoRa's, Wi-Fi's, so on and so forth. Now, again, after this topic, we will talk about some commercial aspects and then I'll ask you, which one would you like to select? I would love to select the best technology. I would love to select the satellite if I can to control these robots. Why would I? Because that would give me the best, uh, the GPS, GSM, whatever system it is there. I'm not that familiar with that, but I would love the best technology to work for me. But at what cost is the, is, is, is the name of the game. So uh, these machines are there. Uh, this is a fact now. There are different types of cleanings. There are wet cleanings. There are dry cleanings. Of course, the wet cleaning is much superior than the dry cleaning. But again, let's go back to the desert environment where until just few years ago, petrol was cheaper than water. So where would I get water to clean all these millions of modules? I don't have water. I don't have the luxury of water. I have to clean the modules without water. Come what may, that's what is there. Unless someone can think of something, and I know some companies are working in this direction as well, because in these deserts, if it's closer to the uh, sea, there's a lot of humidity. And that is becoming a big problem for dry robotic cleaning or dry cleaning of modules. The moment the humidity goes above a certain percentage, sorry I'm not at liberty of sharing that at the moment, uh, it becomes a problem. The dry cleaning cannot work. So what do you do? You stop the cleaning process. When you stop the cleaning process, the modules remain dirty. Generation is low. No matter how much the efficiency of a solar module is, guys, it's covered with Centi not centimeters, with millimeters of sand. Doesn't matter how good the efficiency was, doesn't matter what kind of coatings the module has. It's, it's, it's a bitter reality. And that's what each and every power plant at a utility scale, which is in those areas, by the way, those areas are 
quite abundant now in 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 uh, almost everywhere in the world so this is what what uh, is is to be looked into and uh, work needs to be done so when it comes to these robotic cleaning systems again well i don't want to divulge more into this this is i can talk to you for 5 days even on this topic this, this is my forte but uh, uh, at at a high level i have articles on linkedin if you guys want to read but at a high level the it's it's a system it's not just one machine that machine in order to make it fully functional needs to be communicating through a communication system needs to be integrated into the power plant if it is not integrated it may become a problem later on or it will definitely cost you more and i have enough uh, numbers with me at least to say what i'm saying uh, then on the structure side you can't just each tracker is separate from the other tracker so there are gaps between the trackers those gaps needs to be bridged who is bridging the gaps as of today more or less the robot companies they come up with their designs literally some of them are out of the box designs so in order to move one robot from one tracker to the other tracker it requires something called a dynamic bridge or a flexible bridge why it's dynamic because it has to cater for the movement of the tracker almost every tracker has minus 60 to plus 60 movement the trackers go out of order as well when they go out of order they usually go to negative 60 or plus 60 sometimes sometimes so what happens if the bridges are not designed properly they will get disconnected so now you have a void the robot will fall and robots are not that uh they are pretty heavy 40 50 kg plus so it can't you can't let them fall to the ground so on and so forth then there has to be a charging mechanism for the robot there has to be some signals that the robot needs to receive so these companies and uh there the, the research is going on uh i can proudly say i have a little bit to play in that research where the which sensors to be used where to put those sensors how to detect what to detect at what time of the day or night because usually this cleaning process happens in the night not in the daytime because in the daytime it will create shedding so and, and there are then again a lot of other things that i can talk about but because of the time limitation i will move to the next topic or just keep in mind that cleaning is one of the most important things when it comes to generation from a solar power asset then there are other equipment installed in the power plants transformers weather stations pv plant skedas uh, the control system which which actually controls everything at the plant uh, and everything needs to be uh, connected seamlessly connected to this uh, brain of the power plant if it is not connected and uh, sometimes that happens as well uh then there are problems so uh, the hmis that these companies are coming up with the skeda companies are coming up with uh they can be customized to the to suit the requirement of the operators and uh, so on and so forth okay in the best consideration of time i think i'll just touch base on this topic this would be the last one and uh i'll take your question so Uh, we touched based on the lcoe the levelized cost of electricity if you i just consulted irena iea and some of the other uh, data available on the internet you can see that uh, i can't read it properly so from point what is this 381 if i'm not mistaken down to 0.057 this is where the lcoe for solar pv has come down in a decade from 2010 to 2020 and i can tell you it has come further down in 2021 and what i can not tell you because that's confidential information as far as i'm concerned here you will see these numbers in a very interesting phase for this year as well but the inter- and and you can compare the same uh the same trend with the other technologies in this slide the other other technologies like the concentrated solar power csp or the winds it has not 
come down that drastically. And part of it, it has to do with the price of the module. Uh, I have a slide which tells you what contributed to how much. But if you see this curve, this, this, this particular uh, image is very interesting. If you see here between 2010 and 2020, well, the maximum LCOEs were slightly above 0.5 um, US dollars per kilowatt hour and they have come down to around point, a little less than 0.2 dollars per kilowatt hour and the weighted averages are well below that. Look at these numbers if you guys can read here. So these are as of Ju mid 2021. This is all information available on the internet and there are other stuff also available. I just put few things here to have a discussion with you on this topic. So just look at this from 1.75 cents per kilowatt hour in 2019 July till April 2021, one cent per kilowatt hour. So this plant in Saudi Arabia, a 600 megawatt plant, it's called Shoeba PV IPP has been awarded at 1.04 cents per kilowatt hour. Guys, one cent per kilowatt hour is what the owner is going to get. Now, the entire food chain has to get paid from this money. How do you do it? This is what needs to be kept into perspective when we are thinking about our researches the way I see it. Please don't get me wrong, but I'm just expressing my own perspective here, my own point of view. This is where the industry is heading to. There are wafer thin margins, not even wafer thin anymore. Uh, when it comes to talking about uh, what kind of technology or what needs to be done in the solar PV industry as of today, because the utility scale power plants are literally it's it's a race down to the bottom, simply put. So if you look at, if you do a little bit of uh, onion peeling of what happened between 2010 and 2020, you can see here that most of, most of it has been contributed by the module. Almost half of it is the reduction in the module price. So that has helped a lot in reducing the LCOE for uh, utility scale power plant. Who is the beneficiary of all of this? We all are. In whichever country we are, it depends on, well, there are country to country dynamics are different, by the way. Uh, but at the end of the day, with the tariff we pay by consuming this electricity gets, should uh, directionally get down uh, because of all these advancements in technology, because of all these savings that people are now able to do. But then again, there are a lot of other things that have also reduced. The soft costs have reduced. The balance of systems or the balance of plant for a PV power plant costs have also come down. Uh, is it going to stay there? I don't think so. 2022 and 2021, between these two uh, dates, you can say, there has been slight increase in the module price, as probably we are all aware of. That will have a little impact on uh, uh, the LCOE. Let's wait and see what the final numbers come out later. But uh, I was asked a question. This is all uh, information available on the internet. Uh, so you can Google it as well. Probably Ning, you asked this question when we met, uh, when, we, when we discussed last time, that there are few things that are being done on modules. So what is the benefit? In order to quantify the benefit, someone has done a very good thing. So these two are two plants in Dubai. Right? I've been to both of them, right? Uh, you can see the comparison between 2.99 cents per kilowatt hour versus 1.69 cents per kilowatt hour. This project is actually being currently executed. It has started dispatching, but it is currently getting executed. One phase is dispatching the other phases are in construction. But look at the amount of bifacial boost it's getting. If I put it on this scale, it's probably around 0 0.001 dollar per kilowatt hour. So this is the amount of effect the bifacial boost is giving to this particular project. But if you still further go and look into 
what constitutes this green part and what constitutes this, uh, uh, this, this O&M part. I'm not talking about financing. Of course, the financing costs have come down. Uh, the financing cost differs from country to country, depends upon the credit rating of the countries, of the institution asking for money, who you are asking to, so on and so forth. There are a lot of things around that. I'm not discussing that in today's topic. Uh, we can discuss that later, but not today. But this is how things have come down. And uh, as a trend, in, in at least in UAE or that part of the world, in the GCC, where most of the projects happen. By the way, if you look into the project execution in the last two, three years, four years, even during COVID time frame, these projects actually did not stop. They worked out ways how to move forward and they did work out. So uh, you can see how the numbers have come down, right? In terms of the cost, the LCOEs, how it differs from country to country is again something of an interest, at least to me, I wanted to share with you. So if you see Australia and you see that it's kind of evenly poised in this curve <laughs> between the both, both the extremes. But look at the same power plant if constructed in India versus the same power plant if, if constructed in Russia or Japan. There's three point something times the difference. Why is that difference over there? because of certain other requirements of the law of the land. These need to be taken into consideration. So when you are comparing a plant inter geography, different from different geographies, if you're comparing technologies or different plants, keep these views into perspective. It's not just that, oh, I have a plant in UAE versus I have a plant in Australia. This should work almost the same. Well, this, there are certain things that are comparable, right? Performance ratios to some extent, yeah. Uh, uh, but not everything is comparable for these uh, for these projects. I can stop here if you guys want because I have few other slides as well. But uh, in the better interest of time, uh, we can stop here. If you have any questions, uh, I would love to take them. I don't know how you guys want to do it. Oh, thanks, Omar, for the very practical. Oh, Samina, so that's very informative. Thank you very much. And uh, we have some time. Yeah. We, we can take some questions. Anybody have questions? Yeah. Richard, please. Yes. Oh, okay. I can repeat the question if you want. No, thanks, I'm a really, really interesting talk. Um, when, uh, bi when bifacial modules are used in utility scale plants, do the developers worry about uneven shading on the rear from the structure, the support structure? Do they try to design the supporting structure to avoid that? Yes, exactly. That's a very interesting question. Uh, the way, well, with the tracker, single axis tracker, you don't have a lot of structure to worry about from the backside, right? But if you want to, if somehow you want to put the bifacial modules in a fixed tilt environment, which actually they are not put, I have not seen in a lot of projects, uh, different companies that they are doing. So it would actually create uh, problems for fixed tilt, but not for uh, trackers, because trackers, uh, you have a lot of space unless you go for the two portrait trackers there you have slightly more structure but still the amount of structure used in trackers for 1p or 2p versus the same amount of structure you use for fixed tilt is significantly different so it would create a difference if you use it for a fixed tilt but not for a tracker okay. yeah. what is probably more of interest is that uh, sometimes vegetation plays a bigger role there uh, and dust gets sometimes sticks to the backside. So uh, there are different coatings available uh, which can be put to the backside to not let dust cling to it or lesser dust cling to it. Um, uh, thank you for the uh, nice slide. I'm just wondering if the uh, using of like mirrors like instead of using this shape of um, 
um, modules if we can use uh, some like uh, off axis mirrors to kind of convert the sunshine to the um, modules or uh, like from the other side uh, on cleaning uh, if we can use some like self cleaning uh, coating on top of the modules or maybe some fans if is it something that developers are interested to uh, see the reason I showed you this slide this slide in particular was because I know there are a lot of ideas out there I get bombarded with ideas from a lot of different people I meet as well. Uh, some robot companies come up with ideas where they have blowers attached to their robot or they have vacuum suction attached to their uh, robots in order to suck the sand and everything. They have a lot of good, very good ideas. Uh, you can direct sunlight, you can do a lot of things in order to increase the sunlight. All you have to do is to make sure you stay within these numbers. That would be my easiest answer here. And this is from 2021. Let's wait and see what happens in 2022. I can't disclose that information, but let's wait and see what happens in 2022. This is the boundary. Uh, uh, this sets the boundary for everything in a utility scale power plant. You want to be in business? You have to stay within this, uh, with this, the, within these numbers, or even beat these numbers. So whatever ideas are there, they have to stay within this. Okay. Uh, yeah. If no more questions, we can close the session. And uh, if anybody are uh, interesting uh, to uh, further talk with Omar and to uh, further discussion, so you are welcome to talk to him after this session and also you are welcome to send emails to Omar as well. We'll share uh, uh, his email as well. Yeah, thank you everybody for sure. attending this session. Yeah, thanks Omar for coming. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me here. Thanks. Thank Pleasure talking to all of you.